Friends, let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated.
It was also a church of the upper crust. Some likely earning their wealth through their trades as metal workers and glass artisans. And in all of these, there was a sense that they had no real need for their fellow Corinthian Christians. And so Paul comes to them with a letter, shaking his head and mumbling, Bless your hearts. <laughs> After his kind opening of giving thanks for all these wonderful gifts they possess, he begins to call them out. What is all this I'm hearing about I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos, I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ? Was I, Paul, a mere mortal who writes in lengthy compound sentences, the one crucified? No, I was not. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No, you were not. <laughs> I, Paul, did not baptize you. It isn't my baptism you received. If you received my baptism, or in the name of any other than the Trinity, it would rob Jesus of that loving, liberating, and life-giving power he won through overcoming death on the cross. Now, I know Paul isn't really stubborn. He probably never drank sweet tea or ate grits in the least. <laughs> but I think if we add a little humanity to the reading of Scripture, we can begin to see that these aren't dead letters on a page of an old, dusty book. Rather, these are echoes from our ancestors to let us know that the human tendency to create factions and divisions and separations have been with us forever. And it's not okay. One of the places where it has been particularly hurtful and awful is in the church. Throughout history, Christians have not always played well with others. <laughs> And I'm not talking about the Crusades, which pitted Christians against Muslims, or the Inquisition, where Christians tormented Jews in Spain. Certainly that was bad, and the hurts and prejudices have lived on in the Abrahamic religions. <clears throat> but I'm talking about how we've treated each other, Christian to Christian, throughout the centuries. Just like that church at Corinth, We've had our internal fights as well, with various Reformation movements in the 1500s all the way up to today. In our Diocese of Georgia, in 1907, Bishop Cleland Nelson ordained Anna Alexander as the first and only African-American deaconess in the Episcopal Church. The following year, Georgia split into two dioceses. Atlanta and parts north and to the west became its own diocese because, you know, it's Atlanta. Everything in Georgia, south and east from the Chattahoochee to the Savannah River in Augusta, became the new diocese of Georgia. It made sense, really, if you think about the geography of the state. I mean, it's rather large for one bishop to get around to all of those areas. But in that process, Bishop Nelson went to Atlanta. There was a man elected Bishop of Georgia, Frederick Reese, who didn't know Deaconess Anna Alexander. And he moved to exclude African Americans in the restructured diocese, not allowing them to participate in church government, governance at convention. Fortunately, Anna Alexander was a formidable deaconess. Despite the discrimination, she made sure that there were Episcopal schools and churches to educate black children and sought funding for her mission outside of the diocese. And even while being placed in the separate, not necessarily equal box, African American worshipers remained faithful to the Episcopal Church until a new bishop 
reunited the two groups after World War II. The Episcopal Church has weathered the storms of schism in our denomination over issues of human sexuality. Other parts of the Anglican Communion are still wrestling with the idea of all the sacraments for all the baptized. Meanwhile, we here at St. Barnabas, we're providing a home to local United Methodists currently living through that same painful breakup in their denomination. I wonder sometimes if the Christian church needs another St. Paul to walk into the churches, shake his head, and mumble, bless your hearts. <laughs> I do have hope for the church. Despite what might make headlines, I am hopeful that there are more of those people who have sat in darkness and are now seeing a great light. People who understand that we are a better church, a better community, a better world, if we unite and work together. Our diversity of difference is not a liability. It's a gift of God to be honored, explore, and ultimately unites us in the common denominator, love. I go back to that question Jesus posed to the disciples in John's Gospel last week. What are you looking for? May this be a week where we discover love in corners, places, and people where we least expect it. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.